Hi, welcome to Room of Thoughts. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Room Thoughts are where I tell you what I think, say, and do. In this case, a patient with maybe CNS lupus. So the patient's a 29-year-old woman who is being transferred to me from out of state. She has had very active lupus in the past, was on immunosuppressives and cytotoxic and steroids and whatnot. And following a hospitalization, she um, started to develop weakness. And then ultimately, she became uh, quadriparesis. She was readmitted to the hospital. She was worked up. She was found to have transverse myelitis. They increased her regimen as far as the therapy uh, and put her now on cyclophosphamide IV and high-dose steroids in addition to her other lupus medicines. At the time that she developed the quadriparesis, her lupus looked like it was doing fairly well, taking, I believe it was just azathioprine and hydroxychloroquine and low-dose prednisone. But this other problem showed up, and the question is, how should she be treated in the future what is this going to be due to? And I'm going to use this case as a launch point for discussing neuropsychiatric SLE, NPSLE, as it is the preferred term, but lupus cerebritis, CNS lupus, goes by a lot of names. What you need to know is the truth is, in spite of all the lupus patients you have, um, I don't think you would guess the real number on how many will have CNS lupus or NPSLE in their lifetime. And the number is about 50%. Many cohort studies have shown that this is true. These cases almost always occur in well-established lupus, but they almost always occur irrespective of lupus activity. So the lupus doesn't necessarily have to be active, nor do they have to have active renal disease or heme or serologic activity. It turns out that neuropsychiatric lupus is probably more common in children and adolescents than it is in adults, but nonetheless, it occurs at all ages. It is rare, rare, rare that lupus would present as cerebritis or cerebritis only. They may present with seizures, but they're going to have other criteria, okay? So when I say rare, I mean like 3% in one series. And again, the spectrum of what constitutes uh, CNS lupus is broad from very mild disease to um, life-threatening disease. The question is, is the neuropsychiatric manifestation due to either vascular insufficiency and disruption or due to immune-mediated inflammatory neuronal dysfunction or damage? And as such, it will affect either the brain or the nerves. In the brain, it could show up as a CVA, seizures, psychosis, dementia, cognitive disorders, worst headache ever. In the nerves, it could show up as a cranial neuropathy, facial palsy, foot drop, weakness, other neuropathies, right? These are the important. And then in the classification of of, of NPSLE, it's either diffuse disease or focal disease. Again, the brain stuff is often diffuse. Seizures, psychosis, cognitive dysfunction, depression, coma. Focal disease are usually the neuropathies. A stroke is considered focal. Transverse myelitis, which is our case that we're talking about, is often considered focal, as would a often a movement disorder. What is the pathology that underlies this? As I said, it's either inflammatory or it's vascular. True vasculitis doesn't occur in association with lupus in the brain. It's rare, rare, rare that you get true vasculitis. And I mean disruption and damage of, uh, of you know medium to a small vessel um, that would lead to these problems. On the other hand, most of the pathology that is seen in brains that have been autopsied from cerebritis patients shows a, a bland, hypertensive-like vasculopathy. And um, that's the most common finding. Less common uh, would be evidence of, uh, of thrombotic events. Okay, So finding vascular disease is often tricky, right? Let's start off the bat by saying, um, that 
most patients who present, let's say, that I, I said this before, I think it's an important point. A lupus patient that gets admitted to the hospital is not being admitted to the hospital for lupus. That's from me to you. They're being admitted for a medical problem. Only peripherally, not related to, to lupus, right? So um, it's Greenwald's Law. I got this from um, Matilda Nicholas. It's, it's a great law that says that if a lupus patient is admitted to the hospital and their reason is not um, easily explained, it's the reason for the hospital is always assumed to be lupus. And that's usually wrong, right? And I'm going to say the only reason where Greenwald's Law is wrong is especially in the brain. When a lupus patient is admitted to the hospital with what may be lupus brain disease, it's probably going to be lupus brain disease. So the differential diagnosis of lupus cerebritis is often a CNS infection, then followed by steroid psychosis. Drug effects, mainly steroids or NSAID, meningoencephalitis, a rare uh, reaction to NSAIDs. Uremic manifestations showing up in the brain, malignant hypertension, antiphospholipid syndrome. And then everything else is rare, rare, rare. Infections in the brain and lupus do occur, but they're really not commonplace, right? We've seen crypto TB, CMV, herpes simplex, salmonella, group B strep, listeria, legionella, you name it, it's all been seen. But they're individual case reports. Lupus cerebritis outweighs them quite a bit. You need to figure out early on whether it's antiphospholipid that's in play because antiphospholipid, as you know, shows up with you know either recurrent thrombotic events, recurrent miscarriages, refractory thrombocytopenia with a positive serology or lupus anticoagulant. One of the main manifestations of recurrent thrombotic events is transverse myelitis. L transverse myelitis and lupus, check for antiphospholipid, check for a vascular disorder and a clotting tendency, and that's what you're going to find, and that is how you're going to treat those patients, right? And if you don't find evidence of antiphospholipid or clotting disorder, then you're going to have to deal with is this inflammatory or not. How are you going to diagnose it? It's hard to diagnose. The tests that you do generally are really nonspecific and really have either you know, high sensitivity but are horribly specific. I mean, just not specific. Or have a low um, sensitivity but maybe a really good specificity. So there is no gold standard. I'm going to tell you what I do. So um, my first thing I do is I do check for lupus activity because I need to know how much I need to treat lupus irrespective of the brain problem we're going to deal with, right? Not that I'm going to treat the lupus and it's going to fix the brain problem. It may or may not. There are a lot of cases of that. My second test is going to be um, spinal fluid. They all need a spinal tap. I don't think you can manage these people without a spinal tap and without brain imaging. On the spinal tap, it's got to be done so you can get enough volume to get the test that you need. I would do, obviously, a cell count, protein, and glucose in cultures, including bizarro bugs, AFB, fungal cultures, right? But that's not where the money is. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because only a third to 40% are going to have the requisite lymphocytic pleocytosis. And that's a WBC count on tube four of one to 40 cells, maybe 50 cells. Any higher than that, it's not lupus cerebritis, right? Less than a third are going to have an elevated protein. Almost nobody has hypoglycorrhea, low glucose in the CSF. So it's not very helpful. You, ne you need to do studies that show that there's in situ, within the brain, immune activation. And that is best shown by looking at a Q albumin, an IgG or IgM index. These tests are, look up Q albumin, look up IgG or IgM index. You need immunoglobulin levels on a paired sample of CSF and serum and albumin levels on CSF and serum. And then you plug in the values into a formula and you'll come up with the Q albumin. The Q albumin is a measure of blood brain barrier being intact and is normally less than nine. It is the CSF um, albumin times a thousand divided by the serum albumin. And it's less than nine. However, 30, 40% of lupus patients, it'll be more than nine but it's between 9 and 15. Low-level disruption of the blood-brain barrier is 
sometimes seen in lupus, but it doesn't tell you the pathology. When you start to see really high Q albumins, above 15, and it's usually a lot above 15, it's like 47, 142, 81, you know, 35. That's major breakdown of blood-brain barrier from vascular disruption or CNS infection. And I'm, by vascular disruption, I mean vasculitis of some sort or uh, thrombotic disease, okay? But that'll tell you whether you're in the game, you're especially in the game for lupus cerebritis if their Q albumin is normal. As I said, 60-70% of them are normal. Next is the IgG index, a disproportionate amount of IgG in the CSF compared to the serum. And how do you do that? It's the CSF IgG divided by the serum IgG, and that's divided by the, the ratio of CSF albumin to serum albumin. And normally that ratio is less than 0.7. The higher it is, the more in situ production of immunoglobulin you're going to have. Now, the IgG or IgM index, both work well, becomes somewhat invalid when the Q albumin is abnormal. And there you have to do something called an IgG LOC, L-O-C. Look it up. Other tests, do I do them? Antineuronal antibodies? No, useless. Um, CSF immune complexes? No, useless. There's a good literature about there, and there's this, uh, disparate views on the use of oligoclonal bands in the, uh, in the CSF, like you would see with MS and MS-like disorders, in lupus cerebritis patients. Jim Seibold was the first to write about that when he was at the University of Pittsburgh. I've never found them. Uh, Sterling West found a whole bunch in his patients at the University of Colorado. Do oligoclonal bands. It doesn't cost anything more, really, uh, and it might be helpful. But you're looking for evidence that something's going on in and around the neurologic tissues of brains with people with lupus cerebritis. You can do serum or CSF ribosomal P antibodies. That's associated, but they're not much value a diagnosis at the time you need it. They have better value in telling you who may be at risk in longitudinally. And then you do MRs. MRs are better. We put up a nice report this week about the value of new 3D, 3 Tesla imaging, looking at vascular, small vessel vascular wall abnormalities, and that, that was really predictive of lesions that were seen in lupus, um, um, CNS lupus. So again, MRI is better. CT, PET, SPECT haven't been proven to be of any value. Some people like the uh, value of EEGs. Again, if I think this is inflammatory, they get high dose steroids. There's no evidence that pulse dose steroids, 1,000 milligrams a day for three days, IV, is any better than high dose, 125 of solumedrol IV, BID for three days. Um, unless the patient's going to die, then I use pulse, right? Uh, I think that's important to do. You know, who should get um, pulse steroids? People who have uh, refractory uh, status epilepticus, people who are have a, um, um, a risk of death. Um, I, those are my main indications. Um, after that, I will, you know, if they're really bad, I'll use cy cyclophosphamide or I'll be as aggressive as I can. But recognize a lot of these patients will come down with cerebritis. Uh, while on multiple DMARDs, including azathioprine, mycophenolate, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, etc. So what's your next step? And you don't want to use cyclophosphamide, but it has worked better. The literature is not very supportive of the use of new biologic therapies. And by that, I mean belimumab, anafrolimab, the new drug, vocalsporin. There's not enough literature to su suggest that they would work really well. There is some literature to suggest that rituximab would work. Uh, but then again, it's a slow-acting drug. You're looking for long-term effects. The last thing I'm going to say is about rapidity of response. Um, in my opinion, only a third of patients will respond to high-dose steroids right away. A third will have a really slow, drawn-out, like 6- to 12-week response. And then a th third will not respond at all. Um, one bright rheumatologist said to me a long time ago, it's bothered me ever since, how do I know that these patients haven't developed a slow you know, CNS virus like the JC virus? I don't know. You can test for that, but I don't know. Uh, and then there are a lot of patients who are refractory. The refractory ones are the ones that you need to worry about, um, the ones you need to work up for a vascular etiology, because maybe you can prevent further problems by anticoagulating them. 
and I would work them up just as you would any other antiphospholipid patient. This patient got an antiphospholipid antibody workup. She was positive. She went on long-term anticoagulation. She did fine. And we just maintain her steroid and, and azathioprine and hydroxychloroquine uh, medicines and stop the cyclophosphamide. That's it on NPSLE.